Software Engineering Radio Episode 61 Internals of GCC. Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Software Engineering Radio. Today this is Arno interviewing Morgan Dieters on compilers and the internals of compilers exemplified on the GNU compiler collection. Morgan, would you like to say some words about yourself? <laughs> sure. Um, uh, hello, my name is Morgan Dieters. Uh, I'm at the uh, Washington University in St. Louis, in St. Louis, Missouri in the USA. Uh, I study under Dr. Ron Citron, uh, who is uh, the I suppose, main compilers guy there with uh, many decades of research. Um, I, uh, I'm a PhD student. I, uh, I've been there for a number of years, and I'm graduating sometime soon in the next uh, six months or years, so hopefully I can find a job. <laughs> you can maybe edit that part out. I, uh, um, I have, a number, I have uh, quite a bit of experience with uh, static analysis, with compilers, with uh, language implementations. Um, going back uh, for a number of years, I've done quite a bit of work on uh, both with Java, but also uh, especially on Java virtual machines, various kinds of uh, static analysis on Java programs, on other kinds of programs, um, dynamic analysis, profiling tools for Java and various other things. Um, but that's, that's really mainly my my forte. I'm in the real-time and embedded systems group at, at Washington University, so most of my work ends up um, dealing not just with languages, programming languages, compilers, but also specifically with real-time and embedded systems, uh, various uh, interesting boards that we get for avionics purposes, etc. Yeah, great. So let's start by taking a look at why should anyone be interested in what compilers are and how they work. What makes that interesting and relevant for everyday life? <laughs> well, it makes it very interesting and relevant because uh, it ultimately, when you compile your software, when you write and compile your software, uh, you want it to run efficiently. You want it to run well on modern processors, taking advantage of, of what uh, modern hardware has to offer you. And, uh, and really, that's the compiler's job to, to perform. Um, Ultimately, that's something you don't have to worry about too much, the, the, too many of the internal details of um, the GNU compiler collection, GCC, or other compilers. But uh, fundamentally, that's, that's the job of, of people like me, other compiler developers, to, uh, <laughs> to make sure that those things, uh, that, that, that efficient implementations of your software programs are, are ultimately created. Okay, so this is sort of a behind-the-scenes look at the internals of things you use every day, it's like going to a car garage and ask mechanics how the internals of the motor work. You shouldn't really have to worry about it, but then it's interesting and might be helpful anyway. <laughs> and it's something that's very relevant, absolutely. And, and you want to make sure that, uh, that the compiler you're using is something that is, that is current and, and, uh, and, and will give you what you want on modern hardware. Absolutely. Yeah, great. So, well, maybe you'd like to start by explaining how a compiler works at the top level? What's the basic idea of the workings, inner workings of a compiler? So fundamentally, a compiler has to read a plain text, generally, source file, and understand what that means, whether it be in C or C++ or Java, and try to understand exactly what you mean by, by writing that, that text source file. So anytime you use a variable, it has to figure out which variable you're referencing, how to access that variable, if it's a local variable or a global variable or any other kind of thing, or whether it's a type. And it has to understand the the semantic uh, uh, content of, of your source program in the context of various other parts of your program that might be included in other source files. Once it figures that out, it has to, uh, generally, compilers will produce some sort of internal representation to mull over this information, to understand it better themselves, to transform it in various ways. And ultimately, it has to produce object code for the target platform of your choice, whether that is um, Java bytecode, if it's producing a portable um, class file, Java class files, for instance, or whether it's producing um, Pentium assembly, or whether it's producing uh, PowerPC assembly or Spark or, or any number of different things. Um, it has to generate something there that is equivalent to your original source program um, but hopefully efficient, because many different translations are possible. There. Okay, so let's drill in a little more and be specific about the GNU compiler collection. 
Um, it's basically a collection of compiler framework. Um, uh, well, that's what you said in yesterday's tutorial. So um, what's special about this? What sets it apart from other compilers? Well, the GCC, the GNU Compiler Collection, is uh, very heavily used. It's, uh, it's very flexible. It's very portable. Uh, you can run it on many different uh, Unix platforms. You can run it on Windows. You can run it on, uh, on Mac OS. You can run it anywhere, um, basically. And, uh, and the, the key advantages are that it accepts many different source file inputs. It can compile C and C++ and Java and Ada and Fortran. And, um, and it can produce uh, output object code for uh, many different target architectures, for PowerPC and Spark and ARM and various embedded uh, systems and uh, Pentium, of course. And, and, and so the, the key advantages of GCC are that it is so flexible and so portable that you can pretty much rely on it and depend on it, on it anywhere for any kind of development in these languages that you're producing uh, and accept that it, and rely on it to produce object code that is effective in many different, for, for many different uh, hardware architectures. How does it achieve this flexibility? Sounds like it's modular in some way. <laughs> yes, uh, GCC internally is very modular. So, that, <clears throat> so fundamentally, GCC is, is composed of a, a language-specific front-end a neutral middle end, and that's what they actually call it, the middle end, uh, that so, is... That, that's, a, that's a funny name, actually. Yes, it, it, it actually is, but, uh, but, but there's also a back end, so they have to have something <laughs> in the middle. So they have to have something in the middle. Uh, so they have, they have a, a language-dependent front end, which can be swapped in either for C or C++ or Java, a, a middle end, which then takes the output of this front end, which is a language-independent intermediate representation... Uh, the middle end then then manipulates and massages this this intermediate representation into something that's uh, more efficient, or at least that it hopes is more efficient, either in space or in, in runtime. Uh, and then the output of the middle end is uh, a representation that the back end can use, and the back end produces specific uh, architecture code. So the back end is then language neutral, but architecture specific. The front end is language dependent, but architecture independent, and the middle end can operate on anything. So you have any front end in, and it's modular with the middle end, and the, mo the middle end can then work with any back end, which is then specific only to the architecture it's producing code for. When you say architecture, you mean a target platform, basically a processor and a, an operating system? That's, that's more or less correct. So a, a specific instruction set that's common on not just one chip, but a, a family of chips. So, for example, the entire uh, Intel 32-bit line of chips, uh, uh, for example, would be one architecture, right, mm -hmm. IA32, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a closer look at these three ends of the compiler. Um, starting with the front end, I find it quite fascinating that so different languages can be parsed and then transformed into a common abstraction. How is that possible, and what does this common abstraction look like? Okay, so commonly in compilers, uh, when the, when the uh, source file, this text file, is, is initially read, it is parsed into a tree-like representation, an abstract syntax tree of some for form, that, that contains the representation of what is meant by the source program. So uh, it's, it's particularly useful to think of it as a tree because expressions naturally fall into a tree. Ar arithmetic expressions, uh, for example, uh, x plus y, the quantity times some constant, um, can be naturally represented by a tree-like structure. What, and, what, in, in what way? Uh, well, by, uh, by having a, a parent node represent, uh, say, an operation like multiplication, and then its operands, its two operands in this case, um, being the specific uh, targets of that multiplication, the first operand and the second operand uh, that you're multiplying by, for instance, in, in an arithmetic sense. So once this, this, this tree representation is built up from the, the source file, the front end needs to do additional processing to figure out exactly what is meant by that. The semantic processing phase uh, will go through and make sure that the types are all valid, that all of the variables you reference have in fact been declared and that they're of the correct type, and that you're not doing anything that, that would cause an error uh, in, in the source language. So anything that's, that's illegal or invalid in C or, or creates some sort of ambiguity uh, can be ruled out at that point and an error can be, or a warning can be, can be issued. Um, 
and at the same time, it goes through and completes the tree. It, it figures out exactly what you're trying to mean by by different source code constructs. So in C, if you're calling a function, it tries to figure out if uh, if that function exists and link it up to to its representation internally of what that function is, uh, so that it can in later phases uh, produce the the code to actually emit that function call. So that is the sort of the a validity check based on this common abstraction that is the output of the front ends. Uh, that, that is correct. This intermediate representation, which is language neutral, is then output from the front ends. So C or C++ or Java, no matter what you put in, ultimately is, it produces this, this GCC-specific intermediate representation, this data structure tree that, that is internal in, in, in GCC, um, that, that represents what you, what you have tried to do with, with your program. That something that is then valid, the, the, it's, it's valid according to the front end, so you haven't violated any of the language's rules. And, uh, and it's something that then the, the later passes of the compiler in going over this intermediate representation can use to, to translate that program to, to the specific target of your choice. So in fact, many translations internally in the compiler are happening. When you, when you look at the compiler from the outside, it's taking a source program and producing you know, Pentium code uh, that you can then run natively on your, uh, on your hardware. But in fact, internally, it's producing many different intermediate representations and, and going over it in many different ways uh, in, in a way that's convenient for it. Like many programs that do data processing do as well, they, they internally structure it in some way that's convenient for them and then output some summary or translation of that data. But getting back to this common tree structure, I mean, for expressions, it's sort of straightforward how they are represented as um, as a tree. And, I mean, expressions are present in basically any language. So that is understandable. But then there are constructs like classes or whatever that are specific for some of the languages and others like C just don't have these How are these represented in this common language neutral representation? Well, they're they're put into it. So so you have a tree type that that represents a a class or a struct in C or C plus uh, plus, some sort of data structure, uh, a composite type to be more specific, and um, and then that 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 tree that that represents that that particular class that it read in from the from the source file then has a list of different fields that are in that with all of their uh, names and access modes and types and everything else uh, of that class. It has a list of all of the methods of that class, anything else that's associated to that class, uh, as part of that tree representation. Um, the tree is basically just a common data structure inside of GCC front ends and that the front end communicates with the, the middle end using. Uh, It's basically just a common way for those things to communicate, and anything that doesn't as naturally fit into that tree structure, anything that's not an expression, is sort of forced into it, but it still works very well in the sense that these trees are then linked and you've got mm -hmm. a common tree structure for absolutely mm -hmm. everything uh, internally. This sounds like some sort of polymorphism with some of the concrete types, some of the concrete node types present in the common part and then specific extensions for the different um, front ends. That's true. So the, the tree structure in many compilers um, that are written using object-oriented languages such as Java or C++, if you look at the compiler source code written in those languages, um, you'll typically find a, an abstract base class tree node or something of this sort that then has different subclasses for every kind of different tree there is. So you'd have one for an arithmetic expression and then further subclasses of that for addition and subtraction and so forth. Um, and a separate tree class for um, function types and for method types and for uh, data structure types and so forth. In GCC, the front ends are actually written in C. And you don't have the object-oriented support of the language that it's written in. You don't have the, the support in C to do that sort of thing. Sort of makes it difficult to use polymorphism. That's true. So, so what they do is sort of the C equivalent, and they create, <laughs> they, they create a, and, and this is used in, in many different projects, not, not just GCC, so you can't pick on GCC <laughs> just specifically. <laughs> But you do see this elsewhere. This is basically uh, pre-object objects, right? It's, it's, what, um, it's what you do for objects and inheritance when you don't have Uh, that support in the in the tar in the language you're writing it in, and that is to create a union to get around the type system, and to put basically anything you want inside of that union. So different fields of the union are in fact all on the same uh, allocated in the same place in memory, and you can have a a tree node union that contains a field for each type of different tree node you have, 
and then access them all through that that common data structure type, even though there are actually many different types. So uh, it's it's not something that's type safe, and it's something that is that is unsafe. And if you do something unsafe in the GCC code, then it can crash at, at runtime. Um, they do have various mechanisms for making that a little bit more convenient than it sounds. But ultimately, yes, you're trying to get around not having language support in order to do that. The reason the GCC has done this is because they want to be very portable. They want you to be able to take an architecture that uh, has only a minimal C compiler available and to be able to create GCC from that. And as part of that, of course, then you get the GNU C compiler and also the C++ compiler and also the Java compiler and, and various other things that, um, uh, that are then convenient for you in, in development. Um, so ultimately, they wanted to be very portable, and they didn't want to require you to have a C++ compiler in order to get GCC. So the idea is that GCC itself can be bootstrapped using just a minimal set of C features, sort of the standard C features. And based on that, once you have a C compiler for a platform, you get the whole GCC um, richness of features. That's correct. But that also means that internally in GCC, things have to be implemented in this this. Well, some of it is 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 created in this minimal C set, and uh, and some of it is created assuming that it already has GCC. And if you are trying to build it using a minimal C compiler, it actually builds a subset of itself, and then creates the rest, uh, compiles the rest of it using that that subset of itself. So there are parts of of GCC, uh, the the main compiler code that um, that are written using this very minimal. Uh, minimal assumptions about the C compiler and other parts of it that assume that you have the extensions that are available in, in GNU C. The, um, the entire GCC source base, if you, if you download and look at the entire source tree, you in fact find quite a bit of C++ and Java, but these are not in the main compiler portions. These are in the standard libraries for C++ and Java. Um, you also find a considerable amount of ADA code if you download the entire package <laughs> and, and various other things as well um, for the ADA compiler and so forth, um, but yeah, the the front ends, generally speaking, for the most part, are are written entirely in C, and so they don't have objects and inheritance and things that we've come to be uh, come to rely on. Okay, so let's now assume that we have this common language independent abstraction of the tree nodes as the output of the front end. So what happens next? So the the middle end then takes this this output from the front end, this standard language-neutral tree representation uh, that is called Gimple, <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it's, it's called Gimple because it's, it's actually um, a, a GNU-C version of the uh, simple language from uh, McGill University. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's a slightly simplified version of the tree representation that some of the front ends use. Uh, and it doesn't have any language extensions in it at this point. It is a a standard way for the front ends to talk to the middle end. And this tree structure is manipulated by different middle end passes. So there's a pass manager that that accumulates many dozens of passes. That But wait a minute. Before we get to these different passes, um, you just said that the different front ends have nodes that are specific to a front end, and now you said it's only the standard part. So how is that transformed? Okay, let me, let me clarify. So the, uh, the front ends, when they initially parse the source file representation and they create this tree representation, can rely on language-specific kinds of trees. So, for example, language features, um, if, if you look at C or C++ or Java code, they have tremendous similarities. And a common representation can do them very, very well. It, it, can, it can operate very effectively on those. They all have the idea of a statement, and they all have the idea of an expression and various arithmetic expressions and integer types and composite types and so forth. Um, but they do also have differences. And so the synchronized construct, for example, in Java doesn't really have an equivalent at the language level in C or C++. And the C++ uh, uh, notion of a try-catch block is different than the Java notion of a try-catch block and so forth. Mm -hmm. So some of these features can have, um, uh, in, in the front end, just for convenience and writing the front end, they can have specific tree node types that represent exactly what they're supposed to do. But the front ends are required to uh, 
resolve all of these language-specific extensions in the tree representation before the tree representation is passed on to the middle end. So there are language-specific extensions that are possible just for convenience in the front end, but at some point they do have to be translated into this, this simpler tree representation for the middle end which is language neutral to operate on. So it's sort of a two-pass front end. First, they are allowed to use extensions for as a, as a pass tree, and then in the second pass, they sort of resolve these extensions to the common set of tree nodes. Yeah, in fact, the front end can perform as many passes as it likes, and many of them do. Uh, you know, typically, they, they load in the source file in some incomplete tree format that... that uh, that doesn't doesn't have a a full i mean it has a representation of the source file but it doesn't it isn't all linked up to to other parts of it and then it typically goes through at least one more pass to complete this tree to uh, do type checking to check that you've initialized all of your variables etc and and some of the front ends can go through multiple passes to do this um And then yes, and then at the end of the at the fr of the end of the front end, when the front end is finally finished uh, with all of its operation and its and its stamping this tree representation as being final, then yes, it does have to resolve any any um, language specific parts of that of that representation. Okay, so the front end is basically a black box that takes text input and gives out a tree of the standard kinds of tree nodes. That's correct. So now it goes into the middle end with these different passes of optimizations. <laughs> That's correct. So the middle end's job is to take this tree representation and produce an equivalent tree representation, which is um, somewhat um, architecture specific. So at this point, some some architecture details come into play, such as what types of registers are available or what types of vector instructions are available on the, on the hardware platform. Um, but the beginning part of the middle end doesn't really worry about that. So the middle end really proceeds in many phases and passes as well. So the middle end's job mainly is to produce an equivalent but slightly lower level representation of this, this tree representation it gets from the front end that should be more efficient, either uh, more efficient in space, a smaller code or representing what will eventually be smaller object code or uh, something that is more efficient in its memory addressing or something that is um, that has fewer instructions and will probably execute faster or something with fewer loops or um, etc. I mean there are a number, number of different optimizations available and it performs many dozens of passes to go over this tree representation and modify it in subtle ways sometimes and sometimes totally reorganize it uh, into something that is equivalent from a programmatic point of view. So if you run it, it should do exactly the same thing if you were to interpret it and execute it like a program. And, and yet something that should run faster. And once all... So, so as, as a simple example, uh, some statements in your program may never be reached. Uh, some, uh, some comparisons that you perform uh, against zero, say, some, some, sometimes perhaps the compiler can prove to itself that that expression can never be zero. And so if you compare it against zero, then either your, uh, your, your if test is, is dead, so to speak. Uh, and that's, that's the terminology used in, uh, in the compiler uh, community. And if, you're, if, if such a statement is or control flow construct is considered to be dead, then it can be removed from the program entirely. Mm -hmm. And in the case of a conditional like an if, then it can potentially remove a large block of code that is dependent on that if too, whatever would never be actually run. So that sort of optimization could be performed to change your code considerably. Um, this sort of thing can come up actually quite commonly when you define constants in your program or when something happens in your to be configurable, right? When you're writing re, retargetable, reconfigurable software, you typically try not to hard code as many things as possible and you define a lot of constants. You define uh, a number of things that then configure that software and many times the compiler can go through and optimize that based on the specific configuration that it is compiling at hand. So basically this middle end looks at the tree representation of a single file and does local optimizations of that by transforming one tree representation into another or basically modifying the tree representation. That is correct. So the middle end uh, proceeds through many dozen passes, as I, as I mentioned, <laughs> uh, through this tree representation and, and creates a, an equivalent tree representation for each method in your source program or each method or function, depending on whatever source language you're coming from. Um, so each one has a tree that represents the code of that function or method, and those are all optimized through these successive passes. The, uh, the, the high-level tree representation is translated then into a low-level 
representation of statements. And this is common in, in many compilers to have multiple levels of, of intermediate representation. And this is also a, a fairly similar one that, that you see in other compilers, uh, which is the register transfer language or RTL format. Uh, RTL is basically just then a sequence of statements that are not quite assembly statements, but that look a lot like them. They're very low-level statements set this particular um, uh, kind of register, if there's a register of uh, register 65, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so at, the, at this level, uh, it is not quite um, defined yet how many, it, it is, it, the compiler does not worry about how many registers are available in the target instruction set, and it assumes it has as many as it likes. And it calls these pseudo-registers, right? Mm -hmm. So you might only have a few registers uh, like the Pentium does, but uh, that, that are actually available and symbolically uh, expressible in the, in the target code. But this level of the compiler assumes it has as many as it, as it can, and later it will figure that out. Um, so so it, it proceeds. RTL contains just very simple instructions uh, that are not a tree-like format, but just a linear sequence of code that represents all these different, uh, uh, that is equivalent to your original source program, but is very low level, uh, contains go-tos and various other things that maybe you don't have in your original source program. So it's sort of like assembler, but sort of um, architecture independent assembler code it's largely architecture independent the the specific backend that you choose for your compiler does um, when, when you produce your compiler the backend that you that you have selected does have some say as far as what RTL instructions are uh, available and used so this expansion from the tree format that I mentioned before this high level tree representation into this RTL that's very low level is guided somewhat by which target platform you use. So if you use a target platform with vector instructions, then the RTL is going to represent that. And anytime you do a lot of uh, array manipulations in a loop, it might uh, translate that into a vector instruction to be more efficient uh, at uh, when, when it actually produces the code. So because the back end is so involved in translating this RTL ultimately to the assembly language, um, because of that, it, it also has some say in, in what this RTL looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have this RTL, and on this RTL, probably some more optimizations are done. That's correct. So many passes are, are then run on this RTL. Once the RTL is expanded from the tree representation, various low-level optimizations can then be performed on that. So these low-level optimizations include many of the same things, the same sort of dead code elimination that I mentioned before, but a lot of the high-level details of the code are now no longer... Uh, available, right? You're looking at a very low-level representation of the code. There are a lot of peephole optimizations that can be made, which basically, if you consider a, uh, if, if if you think of printing out a large page of code, uh, very low-level code, maybe assembly code or something at that level, and taking a, a small a small frame, a slide or a magnifying glass, sort of down the length of the code, and looking for specific sequences of instructions that you know can be replaced with more efficient instructions and then replacing them. That's what a peephole optimization is. So you're just looking at a small range of instructions and replacing known anti-patterns, basically, with, with equivalent code, which you know to run a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So this can change addressing modes, various other things. So that sort of thing is, is easily performed on the RTL, as well as more global optimizations that, that do look at what is uh, available in the low-level representation and replace it. Some things are more easily done at the low level. Some things are more easily done at the high level. And, and that sort of depends you know, however you want to write your optimization pass. Mm -hmm. uh, the history of GCC is also that in the past, the tree representation didn't exist as a standard language neutral uh, intermediate representation uh, way back in the, in the wilderness days. Of, <laughs> well, not the wilderness days of GCC, but, but back, when, back when we all knew to, back when we all originally uh, grew to love it, uh, it didn't have as, as standard a, a tree representation. So many of these tree passes are, are actually pretty recent in the compiler. And originally, the RTL passes were what you had as the optimization passes. And so the front end would produce RTL or something that could be easily produced into, uh, translated into RTL. And then the RTL um, optimization passes were all you had. So historically, there are a lot of RTL low-level optimization passes for that reason as well, and the tree ones are much newer. Uh, right now in GCC, they both exist, and they probably will both continue to exist because some optimizations are more easily targeted at different levels of abstraction in the code. Um, at some point then during the RTL passes, uh, halfway through or a little bit more than halfway through, um, the one RTL pass, which is probably the most important uh, marker of all of them, is the uh, register allocation phase. And this is where these pseudo-registers that I've said in the past that the, the compiler can uh, assume it has a, an infinite number of registers, uh, basically. And 
at this point, it actually has to uh, come to terms with reality that on the <laughs> that on uh, Spark architecture it has uh, certain types of registers and and uh, access modes and uh, instructions for accessing them efficiently. And on PowerPC, the story is a little different. On on Pentium, the story is quite different, and um, and so it has to actually uh, meet reality and. Uh, assign hard registers, the actual registers. So, uh, so the actual optimizations were easier to do while you, ha while assuming you had as many registers as you chose to have. And then when you finish with the optimizations, you sort of try to break them down and make compromises and actually put things into memory and immediately um, instead of having them in register, that sort of thing? Or? That's true. That's true. So um, many times, for example, you might be using, uh, or, or the internal representation of your program, might be using pseudo-register 13 and pseudo-register 65 in such ways that they don't actually overlap. And at the register allocation phase, it can map those onto the same hardware register. It can use the Pentium register EAX, let's say, for both of them. And uh, it has no difficulty doing that, but at some point in the, in the passes, it has to discover that it can do that sort of thing. So it doesn't necessarily cost you anything. Typically, what does happen is that you're using many different values at once <laughs> and that it has to spill, especially on Pentium, it has to spill many um, uh, values to the stack, right? So it does actually have to go out to memory to write back in and, and perform additional computations with them. So that's, that's definitely the case. And during register allocation, it does as well as it can to store... Uh, frequently used variables or the equivalent of variables at this level of abstraction. Uh, many of your program variables in actual hardware registers for speed, but at some point, yes, it does have to compromise and uh, and accept that some of those are going to go to memory and then um, have to be loaded back at some point. Just to give some idea, how many registers do the different architectures actually have? Currently, <laughs> oh uh, well, I, I'm not uh, I'm not the best person maybe to uh, to compare architectures. Um, I'm I'm most familiar with uh, with x86 architectures, and in the actual hardware, I think uh, many more registers are available. But the ones that were actually that are actually usable for generic program data on 32-bit Intel are just a few. I mean, there's the um, uh, the, the common ones are EAX, BA, EBX. I'm sorry, EAX. EBX, ECX, and EDX, which are the extended <laughs> ones from way back in the, in mm -hmm. the old 16-bit uh, days. Um, so those are the extended you know, 32-bit general registers for anything. There are a couple of index registers. There's the stack register, the, um, the program counter, various other things that you can't use as easily for generic program data. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, you're sort of limited to using a few, and the compiler and runtime system typically reserve also one or two of those for, um, you know, a pointer to global or thread-specific data and, um, and various other things internally. So, so ultimately, the, the number of registers, say, on Pentium that, that it can assign values to um, of your program are, are very few. Okay, so now we have the registers assigned. What's next? So the register allocation, having been completed, uh, there are a few more RTL passes to perform some, some very low-level optimizations that are mainly architecture-specific. And then the specific description of the machine that GCC has for the architecture family, for the processor family, and for the specific chip that you're compiling code for, the description of this machine that GCC has Uh, is used to match this RTL code against ways of implementing it in the actual assembly code. So the RTL has uh, some way of representing a, uh, you know, the addition of two 32-bit uh, integers, let's say. And whenever, the, uh, whenever that particular pattern is seen, when you're adding two 32-bit integers, whether it be a register in memory or a memory in a register or various other or memory in a, an offset from memory and a register, you know, all the different addressing mm -hmm. modes that are possible, uh, that is matched. The RTL, um, the, the RTL that, that expresses that is matched and an equivalent assembly language um, line or, or group of assembly language instructions uh, is then produced in the output stream. So this, this, this template matching is, is performed by, uh, as I said, the description of the specific machine. And this machine description file, one which exists for every back end available in GCC, um, derives this, this template matching. So it can specifically tell GCC, the main GCC uh, driver, 
Okay, so this description of the machine uh, that GCC has for every architecture, for every processor family, and even for specific chips, um, then allows you to match, or allows GCC to match the specific RTL that it has at this level with specific assembly instructions that it knows will will implement it. So uh, the RTL templates look something like, uh, you know, set some value that, uh, is uh, a register to some other value which is immediate and then an immediate constant. This and sounds then quite cool. It's quite modular, apparently. I mean, you have it, you're have you speaking of this machine description file. So is it, it sounds like there's actually one file for each kind of processor and all the specifics of the processor, processor are basically in this description file. I mean, that's amazing. That's that's mostly true. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with, with, with certain... Caveats, but uh, but yes, the machine description file does include uh, a very large amount of information and codes a very large amount of information about what's available in the processor and what sort of code can be generated. So it However, probably have some sort of, of of regular expression or something like that to describe what sort of RTL you want to transform into what kind of assembly output. That's true. So so basically, what you end up seeing is uh, a number of different. Um, Uh, pattern matching groups that basically say if, if the RTL looks something like this, matching on the different types of the operands, and t by types here I basically mean the um, addressing mode, whether it's an integer constant versus a register versus a memory reference, um, you know, and, and there are various other details, but that sort of thing. Um, when you're doing a simple assignment, let's say, from memory into a register, in RTL, then the operands can be matched a certain way to the set instruction, the assign instruction. And then particular, um, uh, you know, a particular assembly language sequence can be output. Um, not everything is completely encoded in the machine description file because the machine description file can, is, is actually very flexible and can rely on external C functions that you provide in, in additional source files. So, so for example, for a, a complicated processor family like uh, the Intel 32-bit <laughs> architecture, um, there are actually many different files that, that go into, into producing this. There's a header file, uh, you know, C.h file that, that gives GCC some idea of what the different registers available are, that uh, gives it some idea of what different addressing modes are available and some other things. <laughs> the machine description file takes care of a lot of the simple work of producing uh, assembly code for the 32-bit Intel platform based on uh, certain RTL template uh, mm -hmm. patterns. But then anything more complicated can be uh, an arbitrary C function can be called to produce assembly for that. So, I mean, it's, it's basically a very flexible format where if you want to escape from the machine description file format, you can call an arbit have it call an arbitrary C function to, to match a template or if a certain template has been matched to, to output the code for it. So it is, it is pretty flexible. Uh, that means that for something that, uh, for a family that has lots of different chips available that it wants to support the, um, The specifics of each, then, for, like like the the Intel family, then you can actually get very specific in the back end and produce a very efficient code for that specific chip. What about multiprocessor environment or multi-core env environments that are common now? Um, does the back end do specific work for optimization for them? That's a good question. I I don't believe it does at this time. Uh, it, it produces mainly, if you're talking about a, a superscalar architecture where it doesn't have to pack a large instruction word of, of different parallel um, instructions to perform, it's, um, it's not really doing anything of that, of that sort for, for, you know, say, SMP, Intel, again, uh, right now. Um, it does use certain, I mean, basically, it will produce assembly that they have found to be efficient. And so if, if they, they might have modified the output assembly of GCC to do things that are more efficient on dual-core machines, but, but I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with any of the specifics of that. Um, yeah, but in, in the case of a machine where it's not a very long instruction word of, of parallel operations, where the, the hardware largely takes care of all of this itself, the compiler doesn't have to do as much. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're talking about a, yeah, a VLIW machine or something, then, then the compiler has to actually support a lot more in the back end to... Uh, advertise what sort of parallelism is available uh, for the hardware to perform. Okay, so now we've reached the stage where actually assembly output is produced, and that is, I think, basically the end of the processing that the compiler per se does. That's correct. So the, the compiler itself, 
basically uh, it doesn't do the assembly work itself. It just produces something that can then be fed into um, a common assembler for whatever architecture you have. Um, and then further from there into a linker to produce a, a final binary which you can run. Um, but the the work of producing a architecture specific program that is equivalent to your original source program has been done at this point. So basically, yes, the compiler's work has been done at this point. In GCC, uh, it, it takes that a little bit step further. It, well, it takes that several steps further. But, but this Sounds like you're somewhat in favor of GCC. I, I've been using GCC for <laughs> many, many years, and uh, uh, I'm sure many of your listeners have. And um, it's, it's a very useful tool. Uh, one of its benefits is that it, it well, I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily, um, it, it's not alone in having this benefit. Certainly other, other tools do this as well. But it doesn't only produce the assembly code. It also provides a driver program that, that wraps the compiler and not only runs the compiler on your source code, but also runs the assembler with the correct arguments, runs the linker with the correct arguments. And generally, these are the GNU assembler and GNU linker, but they don't have to be if you're running on a non-GNU Linux platform, for example. Um, but the driver program can then run the, run the compiler on your source program, run the assembler, run the linker. Everything's taken care of for you automatically. So, in fact, when I or you or any of your listeners run GCC at the command line on their Hello World program, um, it, it takes care of a lot of this work for you, and you don't ever have to worry about um, how to link it appropriately, how to, how to link it up with the C library to, 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 to work and so forth on your platform. Everything like that is basically taken care of by its driver program. But the compiler itself for C or C++ or Java or whatever, is, um, is basically done at the point when it produces that mm. assembly code. Okay, now let's assume that we or some of our listeners have become curious and want to take a closer look at the internals of GCC. What would be some pointers to actually, let's say someone downloads the source code, the entire source code of GCC over the URL that will be in the show notes, and then wants to take a look at some interesting parts of the source code. Could you give some pointers that sort of are key and interesting to understand what's going on? Okay, would you like me to navigate the source code basically here over the radio? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so if, you're, if you're in the top level of the, of the source tree, um, you'll actually notice a number of different directories that, uh, that have to do with various parts of the, the entire platform, uh, some of which we haven't talked about today. The most important one is the GCC directory. So you're inside of the GCC top-level directory, and then if you look at the GCC directory inside of that, you'll find all of the compiler sources. Basically, all of the front ends are in there. Um, all of the, the middle-end passes that we talked about today are there. The back ends are all in there, everything else. Okay, so maybe I'll return to this, but, but that's, that's basically where everything mm -hmm. we've talked about is. There's the... Uh, lib standard C++, that's L-I-B-S-T-D C++ <laughs> V3 directory, and that's the standard C++ library, all of the STL, everything else that's implemented as uh, part of the GCC project, but this isn't part of the compiler, this is the support, the runtime support library. Mm -hmm. All of the headers, all of the files that are associated, um, the source files that are associated with the C++ standard library. There's lib Java, L-I-B-J-A-V-A, which is the standard uh, Java runtime um, That's, that's available for, uh, for GNU Java compiled programs. Uh, and this includes the entire class library or most of the class library um, uh, functionality, a lot of the runtime, the dynamic class loading capabilities. Which sounds sort of weird. I mean, having Java code compiled to native is something that Java developers really need to get used to. Maybe you'd like to, um, to say some words about why it's necessary to have separate, uh, have a separate implementation of the standard Java library. Uh, okay, uh, so so I mean, um, Java is um, Java folks you are just not used to having their code compiled to native. So it's so this is basically what I'm talking about here is ahead of time compilation. When you use GNU's Java compiler, you can you can instruct it to produce you the usual class file output. You can have it produce a dot class file just like um, Java C or Jikes would, or or you know Eclipse or any number of things, uh, or you can. Um, uh, instruct it to produce object code. You can you know, instruct it to compile it just like it would C or C++. Mm -hmm. there, there are some advantages to that. Uh, the advantages are not as many as they used to be because now there are sophisticated uh, just-in-time compilers that can actually do a bit more because they have a lot of profiling data about the program as it actually runs, the classes, uh, the Java classes, um, and can 
also optimize dynamically loaded classes and various other things. Um, but ahead of time compilation with GNU Java is very useful in my work for uh, embedded systems in particular, where you don't have the the ability because you don't have the memory or you don't have the resources, you don't have the power to run a full JVM with a sophisticated just-in-time compiler, but you don't need the extra flexibility because of the application you're working on of having dynamic class-loaded files that are heavily performing. And so basically if you're talking about a small embedded computer with very little memory that, uh, that might only run a minimal Linux kernel, if any at all, you don't want to just uh, upload dot class files to it and then require a, a large JVM to support, which may not even be available for the platform. Uh, for many, it's not. So ahead of time compilation into something that's equivalent to C or C++ code that has been compiled uh, is then very useful for these kinds of machines. It can be useful in other, in other um, places as well. GCC does include a lot of optimizations and can do a tremendous amount before runtime. You don't have to pay the overhead of actually compiling at runtime as you do with uh, just-in-time compilers. Um, and so for many programs, GCJ compiled Java programs can perform very well compared to uh, other approaches, uh, sophisticated JVMs with, uh, uh, with um, highly optimizing just-in-time compilers in them. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not necessarily a, a bad thing to ahead of t- ahead of time compile everything ahead of time. I'm sorry, that's that's redundant. <laughs> it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to uh, compile everything ahead of time uh, as opposed to producing a dot class file. Uh, but there are advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages, of course, are that uh, it's no longer portable. You can't distribute mm-hmm. your dot class file to everybody yeah, sure. on every uh, hardware architecture and expect it to work. To go back to this directory structure, what, let's look at two or three interesting files. What would you say are key, actually, source files of the GCC that give an idea of what's actually going on? People should look at if they want to get an idea. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll probably have to give slightly more than three. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, maybe 30. Um, <laughs> I, 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 can, I, can, I can give a few pointers if, if you're mm-hmm. uh, opening up uh, the GCC source tree and you're interested in looking at a few files in the compiler that are most interesting. Um, you can go inside the GCC directory and then inside the config directory and you'll find a directory for every backend that's available, every uh, hardware architecture, right? So uh, uh, i386, let's pick on, because we've been picking on it uh, so far today. You can go into the i386 directory, and then you'll find an i386.md um, file. And that's the machine description file that I mentioned before, and inside of there you'll find a lot of uh, uh, RTL templates. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the things that look like Lisp symbolic expressions, <laughs> if you're familiar with them. <laughs> Um, you'll find a lot of those that match um, standard operations that GCC needs to perform with um, uh, with the associated RTL and with the associated assembly instructions. So that's one place that's sort of interesting to look to to see that uh, instruction selection phase. So that's at the end. Um, starting back at the top level directory, if you go into the GCC source directory and then look at the... Um, uh, passes.c file, you'll see what's what what drives the middle end. This is the pass manager that I mentioned before that, that orders all of the different optimization passes, not only on the tree representation, but also on the RTL uh, representation. So that's where the list of all the optimizations is basically as one call per optimization for all these dozens of passes that actually take place in the That's middle right, end. that's right. And if you if you look for the C macro next underscore pass, all in uh, <laughs> uppercase, if I'm trying to remember what the source file looks like here uh, without uh, being able to look at it, uh, you'll find uh, all of the different passes ordered there. So if you're interested in what passes uh, are performed in what orders, uh, that's a good place to look. Uh, most of those passes have similarly named source files um, that are available in that same directory. So then if you're interested in, say, uh, uh, dead code elimination, as I mentioned before, which is the DCE optimization, then you can uh, look at the, in the same directory, you can look at the tree-ssa-dce.c file. <laughs> and that's, um, that's the, the, um, the dead code elimination pass for GCC. And if you look through that source code, you'll, that source file, you'll see exactly how um, uh, dead code elimination is done on the, uh, 
um, tree representation inside of GCC. So there, there are no secrets here. It's an open source project, <laughs> and you can and you can take a look at everything, and everything's accessible. So that's the middle end. If you're interested in the front ends, I would I would uh, uh, recommend um, for Java. It's most easily uh, accessible, I suppose. Um, and just because of the way that the front end is, is structured and the fact that many people know Java, I, I don't know your listener base, I suppose, but um, Java is usually a, a, a simpler language to look at than, than um, C++ because of the additional features that C++ has that, that makes uh, language implementations a little bit more difficult. Here, here. <laughs> um, well, some, sometimes writing in C++ can be more difficult, but uh, at least language implement implementers have a larger job. Yeah, I was just um, joking. C++ is a great language and um, <laughs> there are... Um, there's good reasons to use C++, but yeah, Java is simpler, obviously, yeah. It, just as an aside, I, uh, I am one of those rare programming language people that don't have necessarily a favorite language. I, um, I, I, I don't favor Java over C++, over Perl, over OCaml, over Haskell, over um, uh, Python or anything else. I enjoy all these languages for, for different projects. And, That's cool. Uh, <laughs> and uh, when, when a... a a particular project that I'm attacking doesn't fit naturally into a language, I, I tend to pick another one. Or if there are many different ones that are possible, I uh, choose them by random lot sometimes <laughs> if I'm not required to choose one. Because it's, it's, it's interesting to, to maintain um, uh, a good skill set across many different languages and to expose yourself to a lot of different things. But I, I, don't, I don't really have a favorite language. I enjoy implementing languages. I like writing programs in various different languages. Um, and and I, I guess I'm more interested in comparing languages than... Uh, than uh, than uh, evangelizing. Yeah. Um, however, um, okay. So <laughs> at least at least in in this case, uh, I, I can say that Java is easier to implement in some mm -hmm. ways, uh, certainly at the language level. And um, and so anyway, so inside of the GCC directory, inside of the Java subdirectory, you can look at parse.y, and this is a a C like file, even despite the .y extension. It's a, a yak grammar, probably. It's a, a yes. It's a, a well. It's a bison grammar, which is mm -hmm. largely uh, compatible back with with yak. Um, which uh, it, it's few tens of thousands of lines long, I think, but <laughs> because it contains a lot of support functions, because it contains a lot of support functions beyond the actual grammar. But this is where the entire Java grammar uh, mm -hmm. lives, and and how it parses those things, and how it generates this this uh, initial tree structure before it has to go through and semantically analyze it and complete it. Uh, that, but that's an excellent place to start looking. At, uh, at the Java front end um, to figure out exactly how it operates on different uh, source level um, constructs. And then from there, you can trace through how different parts of that front end work. Thank you very much. It's been fun discussing GCC with you. Thank you, Arno. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want to get more information about Software Engineering Radio or if you want to give us feedback, please go to our website at se-radio.net. You can also contact the team at team at se-radio.net, although we prefer entries in our comment system on the website so other people can see what you think. Software Engineering Radio wants to thank Henning Pauli for the intro and outro music, as well as Lipson for providing the bandwidth. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, is licensed under Creative Commons license. See the Software Engineering Radio website for details.